Good morning and welcome. Thank you for getting out of bed uh, and coming along to learn a little bit more about how to convert website leads into sales. I'm Rebecca Caro and Creative Agency Secrets is my team of people who do outsource marketing services. We help busy businesses find the right balance and make some marketing techniques that will help them achieve their goals. Now in the past, we've run events about how to get people to come and visit your website um, and how to get them those visitors to make them into leads. This training is about taking the next step, so going from an inquiry or a lead through to trying to make an actual sale. So let's start by asking what's a lead. Do any of you have in your own businesses a definition of a lead? Show of hands. Um, to inquiry as to information. Okay. Pricing. Okay. Anyone else? A referral. Okay. I looked it up, of course. There's always a dictionary definition for everything. But it says a sales lead is the identification of a person or an entity that has the interest and the authority to purchase a product or service. And so those of you who've got your notepads out, I'm really glad you've got that, because you're going to be taking notes on this. If you have not, in your own team, defined what a lead is, it's well worth spending a little bit of time to do that, because unless you're absolutely clear, you know that you will be unclear and being unspecific, and then, of course, there's the potential to miss out on leads. Like any good salesperson, they hate the thought that someone might have potentially slip through the net. Moving on from what's a lead, I want to back out to a little bit more context about how people actually buy. How many of you have heard of the buyer's journey? Yeah, a couple of nods. So the idea of a buyer's journey is how does someone go from being out there in the morass, and when I say someone, it could be a business or it could be a person. How do they go from being utterly unaware of you and what you do through to becoming a loyal and committed customer? And they're generally accepted to be um, four stages. The first is discover. You learn about the business and you know its name. Then you go to the second stage, which is explore. So finding out more about the business and what it does. The third stage is engage, which is usually deemed to mean a dialogue at which point you reveal yourself as a potential customer and you want to find out a bit more, maybe people ask about specifications or pricing or availability or stock levels. And then of course buying is the last stage. Now, sales and marketing as a, as a combined entity have the very straightforward job of guiding the mass of prospective clients through to becoming actual paying customers. And that is, in a broad term, the sense of what the purpose of sales and marketing is. But my question to you is, do you know what the actual buyer's journey is for your business? Because there are lots of different ones. And if, if you think it's terribly linear and straightforward, I'm going to tell you, almost 100% guaranteed it's not. In Google Analytics, which I'm sure a lot of you have got installed on your websites, there's a lovely little subsection that shows the different conversion paths that people take. And it shows whether people have come from natural search or paid search, and which pages they went to, and whether they went away and came back again, and exactly what led them to eventually get to a goal or a checkout. And what never ceases to amaze me is that some of these have multiple steps, like more than five different steps. And you go, well, yeah, I can understand that. Someone might have done a search, and then they might have come to our website, and then they might have forgotten about it, and then come back a week later and thought, I wonder who they were. I'll do the same search again, and you show up again, and they come in again. What puzzles me, though, is the fact that you have more than one person doing what appears to be the exact same sequence of steps. And that tells you that they aren't just a lone person. It is a, 
possibly a cohort of people out there who could be customers of your business who are doing a similar sort of thing and arriving at your website and becoming customers. And so part of your jobs is to learn the different buyer journeys and if you can, to understand how, you mentioned referrals. How does referrals fit into a buyer journey and is that very different from a telephone inquiries buyer journey? And of course the journey isn't just about them. It's about you and what your firm does, what your business does to coax them to take that next step and to step up closer to being a customer. So again, an action for when you get back to the office, ask your colleagues what they think the buyer's journey is. And what are the things that a buyer needs to satisfy at each of those stages from discover through explore, engage, and buy. How many of you are in business to business organisations? One, two, four. And the rest of you are a business consumer. So it could be quite different for a B2B versus a B2C customer. And I would presume at this point to make generalisations. Your business will be peculiar in the right sense and different. And it's up to you to learn what that is. Moving on, we've got these people, we're leading them towards an engagement, we're hoping that they're going to get close to buying. But not everybody is a desirable customer. We've all seen time kickers, time wasters, but we've also seen people who've led us a merry dance and not bought at the end, or have bought in an unsatisfactory business relationship. I don't want to dwell on the anecdote, but one of the things that you can usefully do that will help improve the quality of your lead conversion is to set up an ideal customer profile. Has anyone got an ideal customer profile? One, two. Would you be willing to share what your ideal customer profile is? Willing and able to pay before they use the product or the service. Okay. So, for the rest of us who have no idea what Vince's product or service is, he's already said he's B2B, but I'm not going to ask for more detail. What challenges does Vince have in establishing a customer who is willing and able to pay before they try the product? So you keep quiet, let the rest of us... We, we need to establish trust. We need to establish trust. What else? My knowledge of the credit history of the building pay. That's a very nice point. What about his product or service? How much? Go on. Um, he would have to be assured that his product's a good product to start with. Absolutely. So there's quite a lot of knowledge, both on, as you said, the side of the customer, and as you've said, on the side of the business that's needed before you're likely to find that instantaneous purchase. It's not impossible, but it's a big challenge. Anyone else got a, an ideal customer profile? Okay, so I'll tell you ours. Creative Agency Secrets, ideal customer, is an owner, a business owner, who is in a business that is busy, where the owner knows that either they're too busy to do the marketing themselves, or they're honest enough to say, actually, I don't know enough about marketing, but I know I need it. So we have a reasonably clear identification of the likely size of business that we're likely to work for. The fact that we need to be speaking with the business owner is quite important for us because generally they're the decision maker. And we've also established that there's um, a state of mind around marketing that is a need that we think we can fulfill. So let's just would someone like to volunteer themselves who hasn't got an idea of customer profile? Would you let the group help you scope out what might be your ideal customer? Kerry? Yeah. Tell, tell the group what your business is. Okay, so um, I'm the uh, business development manager at Canada Out, and we do uh, specialise only in this area of property management. So my job is to go out and build that uh, customer client base and uh, I'm always looking for the oh, ideal customer. Okay, so let's start off. Kerry sells property management services for residential property. What do you think is the first thing we can write down as being 
a requirement for her ideal customer profile? Somebody that owns property. Someone that owns residential property. Right. Yeah, I was going to say existing landlord with yep. residential commercial buildings. Yep. So, Karen, do you take people who've got single properties or do you, they have to have several? No, no, we can take all. Okay, so we'll then. Go on, sorry. We'll look at Okay, so what we've done is we've then specified that the company is interested in single landlords as well as people with multiple tenancies. What else might mean what might we put down? Let me see the value. Absolutely. So they understand the service and they see the value in property management or a managed rental property. What other things are there that might affect Kerry? So she's in Parnell, that's the clue. Okay, I own a property, it's in Dunedin. Is Kerry going to be interested in working with me? <laughs> Probably not. So there's a geographic territorial limitation. Your property needs to be within, you'll tell us, where do you operate? Auckland. Okay, oh, great job. Oh. So, you know, so there's a, a geographical limitation there. What about other things in terms of, um, are there any, what about ability to pay? No, How do you, I think that comes from the tenant. Comes from the tenant. Now, do you provide services to find tenants or do you just manage yes, the property? Yes, we do. Okay. okay. So how does what Stephen say relates to your service if the ability to pay comes from the tenant? That's part of our services to screen tenants and make sure that they are, you know, the ideal tenant is able to pay. So we, we do credit checks and everything. So in terms of your confidence in getting paid for your service and not having bad debts, the service is set up in such a way that because you're finding the tenant, you then take your fee out before you pay the landlord. So you know, it, it's slightly different from other businesses where we might raise invoices and, and wait for them to pay. What other things might um, Kerry be looking at? Perhaps some negative attributes that she would want to avoid. And then we can do the work itself. Yeah, so someone who thinks they can do the work themselves. That's, I'm sure, a common feature. <laughs> Yeah. Why would I pay a property manager? I can change light bulbs. Probably people are time poor or landlords that can't be modeled the hassle. Yep. Don't have the time or the ability or expertise. Great. So people um, who are like that, um, what sort of people do they tend to be? As in, they're usually doing another oh, job. Oh, you know, business owners, yep. other interests. So they're not full-time professional landlords. Yeah, the landlord thing is a bit on the side. Yeah. So again, that gives you another possible reference point. Someone who is a full-time professional landlord is reasonably likely to want to do the management themselves. Is that, is that fair? Yes and no. Um, it, what we're saying is that there's a, there's a threshold, you know, they'll get to like five plus properties and now it's too much. Yep. And they have to hand it over. So. Okay. Do you ever come into situations with conflict of interest? With your business, uh, as in, maybe, I mean, maybe you don't. But if a landlord has properties managed with you and then properties managed with someone else, is that oh, a problem? No, it's not. Um, we've got someone who's got thirty apartments and we've only got two. Of them. Okay. So, what we other businesses, you know, for us, we we didn't win a client the other month because they said that one of our existing clients was too similar to theirs, and they felt that they didn't want to work there. So the sorts of things we've worked through are helping Kerry build up a picture of her ideal customer. And so who can think of why you want an ideal customer in the context of website leads? Yeah. Go on. Yeah, so so you can set it up the way that it's going to take someone around the website to that, that's so. absolutely. What else? To pitch their person. Correct. To exclude people who don't fit your ideal customer. So from Vince's point of view, he wants people who are prepared to pay before they've tried the product. So if, his, if on his website it, it goes, you know, put your credit card in now, anyone who's not prepared to do that will automatically exclude themselves because they won't take that step to get closer to a purchase. Um, so that's one of the benefits of the ideal customer. And it's also, it's quite, I, I don't know if you ever watch television and you look at one of the adverts and go, what was all that about? You realise that they're not targeting people like you. 
You say, I, I don't, that doesn't resonate, it's not interesting. Same thing applies on your website. If what your website is saying does not seem to fit what you think you need, you'll go away. And that's a good thing, because it means that your company can then focus their time and energy to the people who are like your ideal customer. So we've established what a lead is. We've taken a look at the different parts of the business and the lead process, the buyer's journey. We've now looked at your ideal customer. Let's move on to marketing and sales. Who has a separate team for marketing and a separate team for sales? One, two, three, two, okay. What's the difference between marketing and sales? Our marketing is the, uh, the ammunition or the strategy to promote the product, provide awareness, and the selling is actually during the business. Okay. So Anyone no, disagree with that? Yeah. Anyone disagree with that? So you work in the marketing yes. side, yeah? Yeah. And what do you see when you go to those meetings, just in general terms? Um, I guess it's about the relationship, I think. Mean, like, like, there's so much trust there mm -hmm. that it's kind of all about implementing everything and making it happen. It's kind of like, yeah. It's not like a hard sell, it's more like a trust relationship. So moving on to the next slide, what I've put up here is a whole load of words and what I'd like you to tell me is which of these are related to marketing and which are related to sales? Pick out the easy ones, which ones are really obviously just marketing? Yeah? Which ones are obviously sales? Telemarketing. Telemarketing. And which ones are both? My thesis is that a most of these things sit across both disciplines because exactly as Joan said, if one is not feeding the other correctly or appropriately, the whole process of the buyer's journey doesn't work. So from your point of view, you're familiar with all these different techniques. How do they actually work for your business? And as we put on the next slide, what happens, Theo, next slide, when an inquiry comes in and where's the handoff between marketing and sales? At what point does something that's happened on the word cloud cease to be one and move to the other? Give us an example. Does anyone know of a situation where you've got both marketing and sales engaged and where you would define the point at which an inquiry moves from one to the other? Well, how about from, say, a, a Google AdWords? Yep. It's, it's marketing. But it goes to a website landing page yep. to me about sales because that's when you, you attempt to post it. Okay, so AdWords written by presumably the marketing team, paid for by the marketing team, creates a click that goes to a landing page created by the marketing team which then captures a customer inquiry. Is that yep. your attention? So at the point at which the inquiry is generated, it stops being a marketing problem and it moves over to being a sales opportunity. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah. I can just say. Oh, no, it's good. <laughs> um, that, um, at that point, marketing team should be supporting the sales team to supply the materials right. that help close the inquiry. But for the landing page, of course, it would be the marketing team that's actually writing it, but I'm just saying it's more of a sales process. Yeah, it is a sales process, but it's also a um, company. So you think you've got a sales and a marketing Well, I suppose a couple of 
she was saying, um, when the quarry comes through and Mark and goes, hey, we look to see that this is you, come and do your magic. I go and I start talking. They're still there, managing it and understanding of what happened throughout the process to begin with the outcome. Yes. So it does sort of get handed over to me and Mark will just hang along in the background, keeping tabs. And at what point do you know that it's your responsibility? Um, from Tom, from their phone, he says hello. So they, how, how does it arrive to come and Oh, okay, so, yeah, he, or he'll pass up with the CRM and all the CRM comes up to you. Yeah. Good. Okay. So, again, hand off. It, there are no hard and fast rules here, but as long as working practice in your team is well understood, you do need to know exactly where that happens. Because are there situations where sales might hand something back to marketing? Is it a one-way line? Give us an example of a situation. When you're, you're supporting a sales team. Yep. Yeah. So um, I'll go out and for example, I need a retail, I need to retail point of sale. It'll come back to me, so I need to get some retail point of sale. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Generate some retail point of sale. Yep. Yeah. Or um, a, a client of ours, like um, an online client wants us to support them and go to work with so sales people will bring me in to support them with that kind of So dialogue is the key, yeah. um, but equally a, re a, a mutual respect and understanding of where the handoff comes. Now, I often talk about Creative Agency Secrets as a business that helps with new business development. And my definition of new business development is everything that takes you through that buyer's journey. So it's both marketing and sales and where they sit side by side with each other. Lead qualifications. We've actually got our lead now. Someone has actually asked the question. There's an inquiry. They're coming through with an expectation or hope on our part that they will buy. How do you qualify a lead? Do you know what lead qualification is? Does anyone have lead qualification processes in place? Yeah? Well, it's, there's multiple stages of the lead qualification. First one is meeting face to face. Yep. Marketing. They don't want to have that meeting, they want to, they want to discuss nothing more than price. They're not very likely to buy. Yeah, that's how I kick them. Just kick them. <laughs> yep. So you can see just from that one line how that really aligns with your ideal customer profile. So people who come in, in your business, who are only interested in price are a negative attribute on your ideal customer profile. And Hopefully, you try and qualify them out or loop them back into more discovery so that they can find that answer and come back when they're ready to buy. This is a little bit of a theory, but it works quite well. Um, in terms of lead call, the first thing is, who are you? It doesn't matter if you're B2B or B2C. If I don't know who you are, you are not A.D. So the first thing in my list of the five stages is your name or if you're a retail business, have you walked into my shop, whether my shop is physical or online? So are you a real person? The second step is, are you on profile in terms of the actual um, ideal customer? Do you tick enough of those boxes? Now, the word ideal is in there for a reason. The perfect customer may happen sometimes, but most of us will know we have a large number of imperfect or partially perfect customers. So which of the attributes, going back to your ideal customer persona, that are really, really essential must-haves, and which are nice to have? So you can see you've got sort of two categories of attribute there. The next thing is, with regard to marketing, that marketing has produced a qualified lead based on customer persona and they've responded to the marketing that you put out. So marketing has passed them through as being on target. And some businesses use lead scoring at this point, which is essentially putting a number against key criteria or key actions that the customer has taken. So you know, if they've come to this particular landing page and downloaded a free white paper or something, you give them so many points and they then have more than a certain number of points, marketing says, this looks like this inquiry is ready to move over to sales to have direct follow-up. 
that tends to be in larger businesses, but you all know that the cost of having a human follow-up and an inquiry is much greater than having an automated process in the background um, supporting them. And it's worthwhile putting the human in as you get closer to the sale because then dialogue can take place and the unique circumstances of the relationship building can begin to take place. Step four is that sales accepts these leads and you might then have a stage of telephone qualification at this point. So whether they're not quite ready to go to the face-to-face -face meeting, I'll ring them up and ask a few questions. Um, at this stage, golden questions are a fantastic tool to use. Does anyone know what a golden question is? Okay, go look on our website now, maybe you want to, but um, there are some really good examples uh, that we have got in the blog if you search for golden questions. So a golden question is a question where the answer tells you more than the question itself implies. And it's a slightly trivial example, but I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you now. I want you to imagine that I'm a pet food brand and I sell those premium cat food ones that come in individual sachets and whatever. How am I going to find out the customers who are most likely to pay a lot more for the cat food than regular customers? And I'm going to run a competition. I'm going to run a competition to win a trip somewhere nice. And it's going to be a yes-no answer to a single question in order for you to enter the competition. So what's the question I'm going to ask that's going to tell me whether you are one of those customers who will buy premium cat food? Do you belong to a cat, cat lovers club? That's quite a nice one, but lots of people who love their club, their club, their cat, may love. That's a good one, keep going. What else? What else do I ask? Do you take your cat for a bit or do you also, who, who, who here owns a cat? Do you take it to the vet regularly? No? Okay, keep going. What else would we ask? Have you thought about the best food for your kid? But it's not a yes, no. So if you say yes, I've thought about it, it doesn't necessarily say I'm going to buy. Keep yeah. going. What breed? Go on. What breed of cat do you have? And do you think that that's... How's that going to tell me that if you've got a pedigree cat, you're going to... Yeah, it's an expensive cat. If yeah, you can purchase. What do you guys think? Would that resonate? You like spoiling your cat or yeah? treating your cat like a child? You're, you're on the right line. So the question is, do you buy your cat a Christmas present? Uh -huh. Because people who are kooky about their pets, remember their birthdays, <laughs> <laughs> buy them Christmas presents. <laughs> so, that's a golden question. It is, it's a fun example, but in all seriousness, in your own business, think about the sort of question that can give a reasonably simple answer, it doesn't have to be yes, no, but that gives enormous insight to your sales team that tells you you are highly likely to be the right sort of customer who's coming close to buying. And that's the point when you're doing telephone qualification if you've got a few of those. So I had a client who was a web developer, and he was, um, do you know what I mean by propeller head? So he's just a massive techie geek. And you say, oh, hi, Julian, I think I might need a new website. And he would dive right on into really deep technical detail and would lose them. The vast majority of people who buy websites are not themselves deeply into the tech. And so we developed a series of questions for him, golden questions that he could ask. And the first one was, um, you know, when did you build your first website? So what do you think we learned from that question? Possibly. So when did you build your first website? Remember? Four years ago. Cool, okay, someone else. When did you build your first website, Martin? Oh, perhaps in the 90s, I guess. Okay, so what's the difference between Martin, who built a website in the 90s, and Andy, who built one four years ago? Yeah, it's nice. Right. The second question since that time, how many times have you substantially revised it? Every day. Substantially? Oh, no. Um, Six months. Okay, Mark. Mm -hmm. How many times have you substantially revised? Um, maybe that? every half year or so. Okay. So, what do you think that tells them? Compared with imagine an imaginary third person who said that since they built their website four years ago, they've never substantially revised it. Knowledge, knowledge, possibly. Exactly. 
and it also shows the likely level of sophistication. So someone who's had a website for four years and has done eight substantial revisions is a very different customer from someone who's had one for four years and has never revised it since that first one. Because every time you revise a website, you improve the functionality and you tweak it so that it better fits what your business needs. So from Julian's point of view, he's trying to sell your website, you're interested in buying a website, it gives him some two really good steers as to how to pitch you on what are the likely things that you're going to be interested in. So that's where the golden questions come in. And the last thing in step five of our lead poll is actually sales qualifying the lead. What's the timeline? Have you got a budget? Are you the decision maker? And is the decision maker engaged in the process? So uh, that's the sort of stuff as you probably tell us, face-to-face -face meetings and quite often some reasonably straight questions. Any questions at, at that point? Right, let's move on to the bit that I like the most out of the whole of this, and that's the new business pipeline. Tracking and managing your leads is the number one thing that your business can do in order to improve your conversion rate of leads that come into your website. If you don't track them, they fall between cracks, they disappear into the ether, and you wonder why the customer never came back. Now, you can use a spreadsheet, you can use a CRM program, it doesn't actually matter. But the sorts of things you need to be listing every single time you get an inquiry is who's dealing with it, who is the prospect and what are their contact details, what other things would you record? What you've done about it so far. Yep, the action taken so far. The timeline, uh, what the yep. last response was, was there an inquiry to follow up? Perfect. So, what's the, the next step? Yeah, how next to keep step? the action moving. Yep. Yeah. Maybe some detail about the actual inquiry, because obviously not everybody inquires about the same thing. Okay. Do any of you use um, sales funnel stages? In these puzzle places. Okay, so when someone makes an inquiry, sometimes they write you a check on the same day. But it's quite rare. What actually happens is people go through a very clear series of stages and your business responds to them in a reasonably predicted way. So the first thing is, I call it prospecting. They're basically looking around. You're on a red chair, a blue chair, a green chair. You're looking around and looking at the chairs. And you might look at the cross. And you might sit on it. You know? So I'm just kind of browsing. And I call that prospecting. The next thing is what I call needs analysis. What is your chair need? Do you need a particular chair like this for the staff? You go out, you can go indoors, it's not particularly comfortable, but you know, you guys are sat here for 40 minutes, thank you very much. You know, and at that point, you may or may not have some dialogue with a salesperson. I say, I'm looking for chairs that can, and you say, these are quite good, but we also sell cushions to go on with a little bit more comfy if you want them indoors. After needs analysis, you qualify them. We've already talked a little bit about qualification. What are the attributes to work out whether or not this person is capable of becoming a customer? If you're a B2B business after that, you might put a written proposition down, a proposal, a price quote, something that's actually got a number against it. So you go, you know, toss up the cost of a dozen chairs, what's this potential lead worth if I close it? Then you might haggle. If you're in New Zealand, everybody always haggles, and is that the best deal? You know, can you deliver it free or whatever it is? And after that, there is a decision to win or lose. And of course, it's, there's a little loop back there that, you know, if they have it, you might go back with a new price and you've got to buy it by the end of the month or it's got to be a cash sale or you can't use a credit card, whatever it is. So each of those stages can be applied to every single inquiry you get. Some never get past stage one. But I align, it's quite a common practice, but you align percentage likelihoods to each of the stages. So the closer you get to the haggling end, the more likely it is that you're going to buy because the buyer's investing in learning more about your product and trying to ensure that you're giving him a really good deal. So your prospecting spreadsheet needs to have some form of percentage likelihood on that. After today, um, if you want it, I'll give you a copy of our spreadsheet that you can just copy and use for your own business keep track of your sales leads. Now, the other thing, what is the other thing if you've got a new business pipeline and a sales tracking 
in place? What's the other thing you need in order to improve your conversion rate of your leads and sales? A red button. A red button. Red button would be good. Um, you mean closing the sale? You mean, uh, um, I mean a, 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 a process. Something that you do. A final revision once you've oh. discovered whether you've won or lost the sale? Yeah, yeah that, that you might do after the fact. So that's an, an appraisal as to the win lose rate. Just follow up. Follow up on people that purchased, people that didn't purchase. Perfect. So, a planned follow-up. And I call this a new business development meeting. Whether it's weekly, fortnightly, everybody in the business who has participated or could participate in closing that sale needs to review your spreadsheet very, very regularly because it should change and it will change. And you need to go through all of the leads and find out whether it's still worthwhile leaving them on the spreadsheet or if it looks like there's no answer. What are you going to do if you ring someone three times and they're not returning your calls or you email them them all? What do you do in your business? Someone rings you, you know, you're not getting any responses. Uh, it's an interesting question because someone told me once that most salespeople drop the lead after three contacts, mm -hmm. but most clients make a decision after seven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So what do you do in your business? Well, you have to be persistent. Mm -hmm. and, and how do you, do you describe that persistency? Uh, well, more information perhaps. You may have to stage or time that more information out over a longer period. Mm -hmm. You might have to lengthen your expectation of your pipeline. Mm -hmm. So as people think that it should be this long, maybe it needs to be this long. Mm -hmm. You might have to revise your expectations on how long it's going to take to make a seven. Okay, so say you get to the seven contacts and it still isn't looking like anything's oh, going to happen. What do you do? At some point, you have to ask why you're not getting the business. And what do you do when you look? You ask why. Do you then throw that lead back to marketing? Do you remember we talked earlier about sales and marketing? Yeah. It should go back into your product development. Mm -hmm. like if everybody's saying we all want red, but you only got black, then it's a product development issue. Okay. So, just thinking again about you know your sales process, and you keep on these spreadsheets for a long time. At the bottom of the page, a very large number of people who have been contacted how uh, many times is appropriate, and do not appear to be ready to buy at this stage for whatever reason. You then need to have a way of culling that sheet because your sales team are genuinely inappropriately interested in the ones that are likely to close. That is what they do, they sell a team to close deals. So how do you keep them engaged in those while ensuring that those who might have a longer sales lead time, a longer funnel, whatever, need more steps in the decision making process, are not forgotten? So Think of some things that you might do that would ensure that those slow burn prospects aren't forgotten. Just employ a newsletter for right. some communication so you're still communicating with them even though they're not reading. So you put them on your newsletter? Absolutely, yeah, or your email, marketing. Mm -hmm. Auto responders, um, automatically send out periodic touch emails. Mm -hmm. Connect on social media, that's a subtle way. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I review with um, my team members, I sort of get about three of them and go, what am I missing here? And then I'll go in there with um, just a couple of tips that they might have given me. Yep. And then um, the second step would be to try to find someone else that I've been communicating with in the business. That's I'll kick start off with them and yep. then see if I can come back again. Yep. So, um, yeah, just to have a strategy review. Hold events like this. This is great. I do. Mark for an outstanding proposal for them too. We also have to create your objections <laughs> yeah. to see, you know, was there something we have missed? Yes. Have we addressed every objection? Because it's, it's all about information flow, isn't it? Okay. If you don't listen, you might have missed it. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you're not. I'll turn on. So the key here is to have a working document, which is your sales pipeline, reviewed regularly by the team, and kept live and active. It's really important it doesn't get too long. 
and they could have a process, which is essentially what we've talked about, of working out what you do with people who aren't engaging at this time and what you can reasonably do to keep the pipeline list at a manageable length. Because it's hideously depressing if you have pages and pages of people who don't get to get anywhere. And so on to the very, very last bit, which in fact we're already touching on, which is lead nurturing. How do we work with these long burn people who might take longer to decide? What can we do to nudge them along? Thank you. Um, Thanks. What can we do to move them back into things like newsletters or autoresponders where there is a mix of personal and automated follow-up that keeps them aware of your company, keeps people remembering that you once contacted them and that they were in dialogue with your product or service, so that should circumstances change, you're on the list. And that's the important thing, is that they haven't forgotten that you're there and the service that you provide. So what marketing do you do that actually draws these long burn prospects closer to coming back and perhaps considering buying? I, I find that if, if a business is active on social media, it's, it's, as long as you produce content, you're also active yourself. It's a very subtle way of keeping in touch right. without directly contacting them. Which social media do you choose? Uh, largely like uh -huh. that. Yeah. And, right. and and it works for you. It does. That's fantastic. Anyone else like that? No. Well, the thing is, you're not, you're not actually emailing them. You're not sending them um, you know, a direct response user. But LinkedIn is. No. Yeah. LinkedIn sends them updates, yeah. doesn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not the bogeyman. man. Yeah, I'm, the, I'm, I'm the good guy. I like that. That's great. <clears throat> so, any questions? What's come out from this that you found particularly resonated for your business? That one thing on your notes that I think was a fine customer. Oh, I do like the customer profile. Yeah. It's also just the, I mean, I have a lot of leads. I think, you know, you can decide, we respond, we get quotes. It's really just the follow up process. I mean, they say no, therefore, do you kind of diary and other contact? What do you send them? Try and send them news, things of interest, but don't engage them. Try and find out why they are not really at this point in time. So, I mean, that's, that's not, there's no answer, correct way to do that. I mean, you can follow a process, but for some reason they're just not ready. No one wants to tell you. No. So, that's good, thank you. Any questions? Thank you all very much indeed. Last slide, I think, is if you want a spreadsheet, get in touch. Um, to say it's a reasonably simple template, but it works, and I know that we use it. Good. Thanks for coming.